This is Lance. He's a first-time speaker, uh, and uh, he's doing an introduction to backdooring operating systems. So, all you Lance. Thank you. Um, my name's Lance. I'm with uh, DC801, where we run a hackerspace up in Salt Lake City. Um, I wrote this presentation kind of as uh, training material for new members of our hackerspace and just kind of to provide a basic introduction to do something kind of interesting with computer security and just kind of see, um, you know, what you can do with just basic tools, not using anything complicated like Metasploit or um, any, you know, complicated coding or anything like that. So this is super introductory. I hope you guys enjoy it. Move that up a little bit. Maybe not. Um, I'd like to give special thanks to Nat D. Mac, uh, Metacortex, Grifter here, and DCAF, and everyone at the DC801 for helping me out with this presentation. You guys have been great. Um, just a little disclaimer, I'm not responsible for anything dumb you do with this information, so <laughs> if you do something dumb after you learn, you're like, oh, I learned this from Nemus at DC801, and here's his phone number. No, I am not responsible. <laughs> So what this presentation does not cover, I'm not going to tell you how to hide your, your back door from skilled forensics investigators. Most of the stuff you see here will probably be um, undetectable by just regular users, but anyone who knows what they're, gonna do, they're doing is going to see this stuff immediately and laugh at you. So just be warned that uh, you can get in trouble and you're not hiding your tracks very well. And then the, uh, I thought it would be uh, good to just kind of give you what I'm assuming your background is. So I'm assuming you have a familiarity with Linux, a familiarity with networking, a familiarity with Windows command line um, administration. So the goal of this talk is to take advantage of a, a user who's left their computer unlocked, right? How many people in here leave their computer unlocked to go to the bathroom? Everyone raise your hands because I know you've all done it, right? I do it too, right? So guess what happens? What happens when you do that and your coworker sees it? You get David Hasselhoff, right? <laughs> Come back, you get this awesome picture, David Hasselhoff, and a great reminder of why you need to lock your computer, right? So I was thinking, you know, okay, we can get the David Hasselhoff in there about the time I, you know, someone goes to the bathroom and comes back. So what else can we do, right? What other things could we do to this person who left the computer unlocked? Well, let's see how fast we can install a backdoor, right? So we have five minutes. We want to get the backdoor installed. We want to get everything set up, and we want to walk away, let them sit down, and then we're going to start messing with them. So we're going to start with just uh, using Windows 7, setting up a Netcat backdoor. Um, Netcat's really good because it's just basically like the hello world of um, back doors. So for this, so what we're using, we're using very basic tools, so we need to have a tool set kind of pre-built. Um, you have to do a uh, setup of all your tools and everything beforehand so you're ready for when the user walks away from their computer. So you want to make sure that you either have those files on a USB drive or they're somewhere on the internet, you can just quickly download them and put them on their computer. Another thing you want to look for is you want to look for portable applications. Portable applications are applications that don't require any DLLs, they don't require any setup process. Basically you just put them on the computer and you can run them. So this is kind of my basic toolkit for Windows 7. Um, I'm using GVim. Windows used to have Edit, which was an awesome command line editor at 16-bit, so the new 64-bit operating system doesn't have it. So I found GVim, and GVim um, has a portable binary, so you can, once you connect to your Netcat backdoor, you can use GVim to edit files. Um, you're also going to want wget, because once you get on there, you're probably going to want more things, so you need a way of downloading that um, through the command line. Um, this is a great tool I found that's compiled for um, Windows 64-bit. There are 32-bit visions out there, but it was kind of hard to find the 64-bit. And then the best place I found to get Netcat was from the Kali Linux image. There's all links here for that. So 
we want to set up netcat. So we get netcat from Kali or wherever we're going to grab it from. And then we're going to set up a backdoor, right? So here in this command, we're running netcat with a listener on port 449. And we're telling it to execute the command line um, CMD. So as soon as I connect to that port through netcat as a client, I'm going to get a command prompt. So before I can connect to it, I have to make the operating system allow me to connect to it. So I have to um, put netcat somewhere, right, in the path. I have to do registry settings. And I have to disable the firewall or add a rule to the firewall to allow me to get to that netcat instance. And they also, um, I'm assuming at this point that the user's logged in and has admin privileges. You do need that to modify the firewall. This example I got is actually expanded from um, the offensive security stuff. They have a great tutorial on setting up a persistent netcat backdoor. I provided a link here and I've provided slides on my website too. Uh, this is the basic Windows commands. If you're just not familiar with them, I thought I'd put these in here just so you kind of have something to reference um, what their correlation to Linux commands are. Um, the key here is Mainly you're just going to add new directories, new items to the path so you're not constantly typing the full name path when you're in there through the netcat session. And this is just kind of an example of what it looks like. So now that we have the firewalls disabled, we have netcat running, we now um, we have it persistent so we modified the registration settings to allow netcat to start when the computer reboots, but we also, we want to get to it right now because we have that five minute window. So here's a VBS script, a, a, a visual basic script that allows us to just start netcat instantly and then walk away. So this puts netcat in the background, starts it listening and we don't have to wait for the user to restart their computer. Then we just connect to the computer through netcat here. Um, you can look at them, probably looks a little faded, I can't see. But basically it's just netcat and we do a verbose mode, the IP address and the port number. And we get connected and we can see that we have a CMD command prompt and we now have access to the remote computer. This works great. Um, local LANs, a little later we'll show you how to get past the firewall and connect through it that way. But now at this point, you can, you know, if you're in, working in the same office or in the same place with the, the target, you can now connect to that computer from your computer and start messing with them. Um, so if you're interested, you can take here to just verify. Oh, didn't touch the cable. Disconnect. Okay, sorry. Yeah, you got to go back to you. It might be this. Yeah. All right. So this is Process Explorer. If you're not familiar with it. Um, Process Explorer lets us kind of look at all the processes that are running on the operating system. So when you're kind of going through this process and you're learning how Netcat works and how all this process works, you can use Process Explorer to verify, yes, Netcat, you know, we run that Netcat script, we can say, yes, Netcat is running in the background there. And that's what's highlighted at the bottom is just that Netcat process. When you guys have a chance, just download Process Explorer and take a look at it. It's pretty cool. And then you wanna, if you want to view connections to it, so after you're connected to your backdoor, you can view that, hey, this netcat executable has a connection coming to it from another IP address. And there's a good tool for Windows is the TCP view to view that. All right. And then so now we have connectivity to the box. So then the next question is, okay, what can I do with this connectivity? What can I do with this backdoor? What fun things can I do to this person who has just left their computer unlocked and now they've come back, right? So 
We, we, I have a list of pranks here. So one cool thing we can do is we can have their keyboard constantly type hello to them. Right? So every 100 seconds, their keyboard just types hello. So they're typing, they're working on a Word document, working on code. There's hello. Keeps going on forever. We can continuously cycle the caps lock button. Every 100 <laughs> seconds, it switches from caps lock on, caps locks off. We can uh, write a bash script to spread random, you know, sp spread all over the place on their file system. You know, start notepad continuously. Starts notepad up, closes it, there it is again. Closes it, there it is again. Or you can even have it start, this is really cool, you can have it start a website up. So they start the website up, close it, there it is again. Start it up, close it, there it is again. Uh, you can make a disk, this is kind of cool, is their keyboard, this makes a disco on their keyboard, basically it cycles the caps lock, num lock, scroll lock, so it just keeps repeating the lights on the keyboard. <laughs> it's really annoying because when you're trying, I so I was testing these and I was trying to disable this one and it kept changing everything while I was trying to turn it off. You know, and this is one of my favorite is you can continuously play the startup tone, right? <laughs> And the best part about it is your coworker's like, why are you restarting your computer? The other guy is like, why do you keep restarting people? I'm not. It just keeps doing that. <laughs> you know, and this is the classic popping the CD-ROM drive in and out, right? <laughs> if you knew something weird's going on when your CD-ROM just keeps going in and out back in the old days. You get control of the computer, what do you got to do? You got to pop the CD-ROM drive. Uh, so. This is what they, uh, this is what's called a fork bomb. So basically what this does is just a piece of code or instructions that continuously eat up resources of the operating system. So this is a fun thing is, you know, they're typing along doing their stuff and then you can start a fork bomb, system crawl, so absolute halt, and they have to reboot. Excuse me. Yes. Sure. New speakers? Me. They're just my oh. troll panel. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say I've, I've been here so long now I feel like I'm a part of this talk mm -hmm. because of all this. Well, anyway, here you go. Thank you. Well, new speakers. Congratulations. Thank you. Cheers, mate. <laughs> <laughs> now they're just a drunk hazard. <laughs> this is another cool uh, little thing. So this is easy to get past if you if you know how to close a file or if you, you know you alt control delete kill a task. If you don't know how to do this, this is super frustrating. Because it makes the file, like you hit the X, you minimize it, it just sits there in the desktop completely and unable to do anything with it. And this one is my favorite. So if you're remoted in to their computer through Netcat, you can start talking to them with Windows 7 because it has a, spe a text to speech engine. So you can start messing with them, start talking with them, saying, hello, hi, what's going on? It seems that you seem to be having troubles with your computer. So we've had our fun, we've done everything, you know, and uh, so we might need, we might run into some issues, we might, might need to reboot their computer because we feel like it, because we feel like it, or we might want to have it happen, you know, after 30 seconds so we can walk out of the room and be like, oh, it wasn't me, I'm not doing this, right? So these are the shutdown commands for Windows and command line. Uh, this is another thing you can do to kind of try to hide your code, so if someone sees what you're doing, and you want to just kind of hide it so they don't know what the script is so they can't use it against you, right, later in the office. You can uh, use uh, batched exe and there's a bunch of other ones here. Some of them, these are kind of sketchy. Batched or worked really well. Um, the VBS one worked pretty well. I tried the PowerShell one, didn't have much luck with it. But basically you can take your, your script and turn it into kind of binary code so it's at that point, they have to like, you know, look at the binary and do things with it. Makes it a little bit more difficult to, to figure out how it works. 
Um, also, it's kind of useful to be able to control the firewall on Windows 7. Uh, these are all the commands that I thought would be useful. Um, you know, you can turn off all the traffic, do all kinds of cool stuff with that. You know, if you write a rule, you can delete it. So that's why you can control the Windows firewall from the command line. So we've set all our scripts up. We've done a bunch of stuff. You know, it's kind of real time. You can, the great tool is you can use the at command to have stuff run later. So you can set up your prank, do a bunch of stuff, walk away from your terminal, get a glass of water, and watch the guy being super frustrated with all the things that are happening to him. This is also a good command too later on if you want to have your, your back door dial out, you can set it up with an at command and have it run um, at a certain time. Um, you can also schedule it with the scheduler, but that kind of creates a process with the operating system that they can go and look at later and be like, huh, what is this, what's this program that's running every day at 3 o'clock? But with at, it's kind of invisible because they have to actually look at the at command and see all of the tasks that are set to run. Another good tool is sdelete. This is a secure delete. It goes through and wipes all of the code or the bind, whatever you, well, basically whatever you tell it to. It goes through and does a deep delete. It's better than normal delete because it doesn't leave fragment, as much fragmentation and, and just remnants of the file. So we've, we've gone over Windows. So let's, let's go to Linux. So, you know, Linux admin, he's, typing away, he goes to the bathroom, I mean, of course he's going to leave his shell in, right? He had a VPN in, he had a SSH through three boxes to get to this box, he's not going to close the session. So what can we do to mess with a Linux user, right? Or just a Linux console that's open. So at this point we're going to need a Linux toolkit too. So uh, another cr cr crucial, crucial tool is the auto SSH. In this case, I went out and compiled GNU Netcat. Um, I had a little bit of trouble with it. We'll go over that later. But, and then Shred and Screen are kind of useful tools. And, you want, and the great thing about Auto SSH is the persistent SSH backdoor. And it doesn't require any other binaries. So once you compile it, um, I took it from one machine to another. And it worked just fine with that compiled version. It was just one file. So uh, GNU. Netcat doesn't have a persistent listener like the Windows Netcat did for Kali. In this version of GNU, I had to said I had to do a while loop on the Netcat listener. So the reason I did this is because the listener would only listen for one inbound connection. So if you got a connection to it, it would do everything, and if you drop the connection, it would stop the process and exit. So I, I set up an undo while loop so that I can continuously connect to it. And so here we can see that we're saying netcat listen on port 445 and then anytime anyone connects execute bin bash. And then again here is the netcat backdoor on Linux um, setup. So I mean you can use wget to get your netcat um, copied into the user bin so it's in path, set up the IP tables and the critical thing here is you want to no hop the listener because we want to disconnect the, the command line um, user from the process. So when they exit their terminal and they go and do something else or they log in a different machine, we can still get to that process and that process isn't owned by that user. Um, so I was trying to think of a good way to hide the netcat to start on boot. Um, I think the best place that I could find was the init D processes. There's a bunch of scripts in there, the startup scripts. People are less likely to look at that. I constantly look at my rc.local file because I you know, want stuff to happen when my system boots up. So if you put it in there, it's more likely to be discovered. Uh, and then just yet again, you use netcat, the version, IP address, port, you connect to it. Now with the Linux version, it's a little different from the Windows version as that you're not going to get the actual command prompt that you're used to. You're just going to get a blank screen that's going to have a cursor in it. You do have connection to the bash shell. If you type ls or something like that, you'll see the command output, but you're not going to see a standard Linux terminal. This is kind of critical because you'll connect to it and you will think that, oh, what, something's wrong with it because I'm not seeing the bash prompt. In this version of GNU Netcat, um, when I connected to it, I did not see a bash prompt. So just something to look out for. 
Um, like, so if we want, so now that we have everything installed, we have everything set up, we kind of want to verify that it's working, that we have everything that we need. Um, so I use netstat -lp -tun, and what that does is it matches processes to listening ports. So here I can see with that underlined red that netcat's listening on 445 and accepting connections from any IP address. Or it's listening on all available IP addresses is what that means. So now we've got connectivity, we've got the same thing we had with the Windows box, now let's do our Linux pranks, right? So this is a cool little Perl script I found. This will turn, if they're using Linux as their main desktop and they browse this stuff, you could even put this inline, but basically it takes every image that they browse to and turns it upside down. <laughs> it's pretty awesome. Then we got a Linux fork bomb, we can take the system to crawl, we can write to the user terminal. If the system's local, this is kind of annoying. You can just cat random, random data to the uh, computer bell sound, right? So they're connected, everything's going fine, and just a bunch of garbage noise starts coming out of their computer. It's pretty funny. And then, um, so this is a cool little prank, is this turns everything in the terminal to bork bork. So they type a command, all the outputs and bork, bork, bork. It's all formatted the way it's supposed to do, but everything's just bork, 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 bork. Bork. So, okay, this, is, this has been a classic prank at my work. My boss did this to me on my first day. Is you send Star Wars to their terminal. So they're typing along, they're configuring their system, you log in, you tell net to towel blinking lights nl and you find their process that they're listening to or their, their PTS instance that they're connected to and they cannot do anything with that terminal except watch Star Wars. <laughs> and it's really annoying because you don't own the process either and it's just keep constantly sending stuff to your terminal. It's pretty funny. You know, another cool things you can do, you can send fortunes to the user's terminal and you can use C matrix. It basically sends a, a matrix screen to their Linux terminal. And, ba and they can still technically, technically they're supposed to be able to type and do stuff, but you can't see the output because it just clears and refreshes and does everything. It's pretty fun. Uh, this is kind of cool. You can, you know, play with the command bell. You know, that annoying bell that goes off all the time when you make a mistake or hit enter or try to tab something that's not there put that in a loop, have it go off randomly and they'll be like, man, you need to turn off your command bell. That's pretty bad. All those mistakes you're making. Um, just again, going over no hup. So uh, it's kind of what you want to do if you don't, if you forget to no hup, because this is going to be very easy, you know, you, you start the command, you're like, crap. I didn't no hup it. It's still used by, the process is still being ran by the user. Um, you can then do a control Z, um, background the process. If you do a percent disown one, it's the kind of the equivalent of NoHub, but NoHub does work better than this. Um, I do that every once in a while. I start a process. It takes forever. I want to go do something else. So I'll disconnect from the process and disown it, and it'll still run in the background, and my terminal session can die. Um, so this, these are PHP compilers, so if you, you know, if you write some great pranks in PHP or something like that, you can compile it, um, kind of hide the code from users, like with the Batchter and all the other stuff. So Netcat. Netcat, so, we, so we've kind of, at this point, we've built a backdoor into both Windows and uh, Linux, and we've got ways to get into it, but Netcat's kind of, you know, it's kind of rough, right? I mean, we can only connect to it if we're on the local area network. It's not encrypted. Um, it's kind of dangerous to leave it open to everyone. So, like, I don't want to open a firewall port on my firewall and allow access into it remotely um, because that would be, you know, bad. It's not encrypted. So now what else could we do with this? How could we get past a firewall easily and get back to this Netcat instance? So what we're going to do is we're going to set up a persistent SSH tunnel. So what we're going to do with this H SSH tunnel is we're going to s have it the, go out from the, the target system and connect back to a server that we have somewhere on the internet. You can use a virtual private server or whatever. And then uh, it's going to map a port 
locally, here's kind of the picture of how it works, it's going to map a port locally on that machine to a port locally on the remote machine. And so if they allow SSH out, or if they allow a port out, it'll maintain a session connection outside to the firewall, or past their firewall to your server, and then you can log into your server, connect to that port on your server, and it tunnels through the SSH connection back to that user's, um, the, the user's machine. So this is uh, reverse SSH tunneling. So here we, we use S SSH F capital N dash R. The R is the remote port. And then we're saying, hey, we want to loop back on this machine to 22. And then so what that's going to do is on my remote Linux server, it's my VPS, it's somewhere out on the internet, uh, it's going to put port 10,000 as a listening port that's going to come back and map to SSH on this local machine here. And here's just kind of a more detailed example of how it works. So I don't have to use uh, 22. I could use, so I've got my netcat port listening, right? So I can just take this SSH instance and map it to my netcat back door. So at this point, it's now bypassing their firewall. I can connect to a Linux remote machine. So if I'm at my friend's house, I can go home and mess with them, right? So I go home, I log into my Linux VPS, I connect to the port, come back, have access to the SSH instance. Now you're probably wondering, like, well, what about passwords? I have, you know, they have to do enter the password and everything. Well, if you generate SSH keys, you can take the SSH key and put it on your remote server and allow it to come, allow that remote connection to just automatically authenticate itself. So you can use SSH key gen and then do um, the uh, SSH copy ID back to your remote server. So now we can set up like a cron job, we can set up a scheduled task and have this uh, SSH remote instance run automatically while we're not there. So on Linux, you can use auto SSH to make the reverse shell persistent. So this way, if it disconnects, you know, the internet's kind of buggy at times, the, it disconnects, it will auto re-authenticate, auto reconnect, and auto reset the uh, connection back to your Linux server. So that, that works great in Windows. You can also do the same thing in, or, sorry, it works great in Linux, so you can do the same thing in Windows. So there's a command line utility called Plink, which is part of the PuTTY library, which you can use to do remote reverse shells back to Linux systems. So you can use this but, um, to set up an SSH reverse shell to your Linux instance and come back to your netcat persistent instance. I was trying to find the equivalent of auto SSH for Windows 7. My encrypted tunnel came close, but it, you know, it has a setup and a GUI and has a system tray, so it's kind of obvious that it's installed. They did, in their, in their documentation, they did say that you can make it portable, but you had to go through a bunch of stuff. Um, that's one thing that's on my list to do to expand this presentation. All right, so at that point, we've kind of set up a back door on systems using really basic tools. We haven't used anything like Metasploit. We haven't done any binary manipulation. manipulation. We just have remote access to the system um, through just basic admin tools, right? So uh, now I'm going to talk a little bit about Metasploit. And so Metasploit takes all of this. We had to do all this prep work. We had to get all these tools in place. Metasploit kind of takes all of that and makes it a little bit more easy to manage. Um, so one, the key to Metasploit, to under, understanding Metasploit, is you need to understand vulnerabilities, exploits, and payloads. Vulnerabilities are places in which you can take advantage of something. There's something wrong with something or something um, not right. So in this case, the kind of vulnerability is the user left their computer unlocked. The exploit is what you do. So you, the exploiting is you installing stuff on their computer because you have access to it now because they've walked away from it. The payload in this case would be netcat, which you're putting on the system to gain access to it later. So uh, using Metasploit, we're going we're to do kind of the same thing. We're going to set up a reverse shell. 
So we just start up the Metasploit console. Um, great way to get uh, Metasploit training is the sense of offensive security, Metasploit Unleashed. Um, unfortunately, I don't have time to go over that. But basically, you just get in the MS console, MS, and then you just can run an MS update and just kind of get all the updates and stuff. Um, and so now let's generate a binary payload instead of using netcat. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to create a binary that we're going to, we can email, we can send to somebody, then they execute it, and then it'll, it'll start a reverse shell that we can connect to like it was netcat. Here we're using MS, MS payload with the Windows reverse shell. Um, so that's the payload. We're basically just going to use Metasploit's payload library to generate our binary. And here's the commands to do that. Um, the L command just shows all the options that you have available here. So in this case, I need to set up a listening port and a listening um, host. So the IP address it's going to listen to, listen on on the, the target machine and the port that I want to connect to. And here too you can use um, MS payloads pretty cool because you can use it to create raw payloads, do uh, payloads in C, um, so you can kind of take, see how it works. So here's the command that we're going to run. We're going to run MS payload, we're going to use a Windows rever shell, reverse TCP, we set the L host, we set the remote port, and so we created our David Hasselhoff exe. And we're going to email that to our victim. Or we're going to, you know, we're going to either have it available or we're going to, you know, put it on their system. You know, be like, hey, I got this great Hasselhoff program you need to check out. Uh, a cool command is file. Um, file lets you verify what type of file you have on a Linux system. So I just like to look, at, I run file just to verify, yes, this is a Windows executable. So we're going to set this reverse shell to connect that we're going to give the user. We're going to have it come back and listen to our instance, right? So at this point we need to set up a, a listener on Metasploit to listen for this instance. So we're going to start the MSF console. We're going to use the exploit multi-handler and we're going to set the L host and the L port. And at this point you're ready to listen for this incoming connection. You send the binary to the user. They execute it. Here is the PS example. They execute the binary. And then here in Metasploit, you sit here and you listen for it to come in. And now you have um, CMD command shell on their system. It's pretty cool. This is a great way, if, you're, if you want to get into this stuff, I think this is kind of like the, the best way to get the most out of your, your, your time and energy. So you can learn something cool real quickly and then you can move on to more advanced things. Uh, so, I want to thank everybody for uh, coming to my talk. Um, this is our code library that I'm building. Um, it has all the code that I have in this presentation, um, minus some stuff I need to put in there. But um, anytime you have a great prank or you have something you want to you know, share with the world, we're going to keep track of a bunch of Linux and Windows pranks that we can send out to people. So if you guys build something or expand on it, I'd love to have you contribute to this and expand this. And then I also have an uh, intro to backdoors.com which has the slide pre uh, presentation, code library, and we'll um, do some other cool stuff with that. This is uh, another cool thing you can, you can get to. These are one line reverse shells so if you set up your Metasploit listener, you can run these commands and have a connection come back to your listener. Um, and then if you're interested in some VPSs or any remote systems, these are some great places you can look for VPS. The problem is, is there's no one good VPS provider. They're usually good for like three or four months and then they kind of peter out and then you can move on to another one. So I always kind of keep up on, you know, which ones are new and which ones, what they allow me to do and what they don't. And then some interesting projects with the Raspberry Pi that are kind of based on the remote SSL, uh, SSH reverse tunnel and uh, you know, kind of using Python to create a backdoor. All right, are there any questions? Thank you.